All right, thank you. Good morning. So I realize I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to get this done in under three hours. Um, I'm going to talk about Don uh, and then some musings on the future of electric propulsion and try to turn you all into uh, solar electric propulsion enthusiasts. So uh, Dawn is a discovery, a NASA discovery mission. Uh, its objective is to explore the giant asteroid Vesta and then go on to the dwarf planet Ceres uh, in a single mission. It's led by uh, Chris Russell from UCLA. He's the PI. Uh, the spacecraft was built by Orbital Sciences and JPL does the mission uh, management, navigation, spacecraft operations, and developed and delivered the ion propulsion system. And the charts I'm going to show on the Dawn mission were really put together by uh, Chuck Garner and uh, Mark Raymond at JPL. So to be successful, Dawn has to uh, go into orbit about both Vesta and Ceres in order to complete the science objectives. Um, it'll be the first, it was the first spacecraft to actually orbit a main belt asteroid, uh, and it'll be the first spacecraft to actually uh, uh, orbit two extraterrestrial bodies. Um, and it's, it can do this because of the ion propulsion system on board. In fact, that system, to complete the mission, has to provide 11 kilometers per second of delta V. It's 11 kilometers per second. That's equivalent to what the launch vehicle provided to, to start the mission. Um, and Don uses the ion propulsion system in order to be affordable within a discovery cost cap. And in fact, all of the major ComSat manufacturers now are using solar electric propulsion, and they do that not because it's cool, which it is, but they do it because it, it saves them money or they make more money. And same thing here, this mission was only affordable because of the electric propulsion system. You can see down here at the bottom, uh, Vesta and Ceres aren't, of course, as big as Mars, but these are really pretty sizable objects. Um, so why, why study Vesta and Ceres? Um, if you can make this out, so you can see where they are. They're actually not too far apart uh, in the main asteroid belt, and yet they're very different. And so the idea of the mission was take the same instrument package to these two very different bodies and try to understand why they're so different and how does that impact the evolution of the, our understanding of the evolution of the solar system. This is what the uh, trajectory looks like. Uh, it's a multi-rev rev trajectory over uh, eight years. It started here, launched in September of 2007. The light colored blue is when we're thrusting, the dark colored is when we're coasting. So we launched there, uh, spent 80 days checking out the spacecraft, and then thrusted most of the way prior to a Mars gravity assist. So we got Mars in here somewhere. Uh, that provided a plane change to get into the inclination of uh, Vesta's orbit. And then we thrusted for a couple of years, almost continuously, to get to Vesta in the summer of 2011, and then spent about a year uh, in orbit at, around Vesta at various orbit altitudes, using the ion propulsion system to change orbit altitudes. And then last fall, we left Vesta and started heading towards Ceres, and that's where we are, at least as of last, uh, early in July. And we're heading toward a arrival at Ceres in the spring of 2015. Um, so a long mission, and as you can tell by the light blue, we're thrusting most of the time. This is an interesting thing. With this spacecraft, the normal state of uh, existence for the spacecraft is to thrust with the propulsion system. Uh, most, almost all spacecraft uh, generally just coast. This is an active spacecraft all the time. So uh, this is, probably don't need to tell this crowd, but this is why we do space missions. This is the best Hubble image of Vesta prior to Dawn's arrival. And on the way in, this is the picture that, that Dawn took. And of course, once they got into orbit, you get much, uh, much closer pictures. But this is why we go places instead of just stay in Earth orbit and, and use telescopes. So there's been another mission, SEP mission to, uh, in this case, a near-Earth asteroid, Itakawa. It was the Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft. And so I thought it'd be interesting to compare the size of Itakawa with Vesta. So Itakawa is 540 meters uh, long, kind of looks like a sea otter. 
And so we try to make a scale drawing of Vesta, uh, Vesta compared to Itakawa. So Itakawa is not this circle, but it's actually a dot, one pixel element in the center there, um, compared to Vesta, which is a thousand times the diameter of, or a billion times the mass. So Vesta is a very big place. And we used the ion propulsion system to both capture into orbit at Vesta and then later, a year later, escape uh, from that body. The capture event using the ion propulsion system was done because that was the lowest risk approach, even though it had never been done before. Normally, an orbit insertion uh, maneuver at a target body is considered a critical event and there's lots of money spent worrying about making sure that happened uh, uh, correctly. The orbit insertion at Vesta was a non-event. In fact, it was such a non-event, it was just part of the normal state of the spacecraft thrusting with the ion propulsion system. They thrust it into orbit and then learned that they had correctly gotten into orbit a couple of days later when they downlinked the telemetry. So there was nobody in the control center during uh, the orbit insertion at Vesta. And then to escape, they reversed the process. You spiral out using the ion propulsion system and, uh, and headed on now towards Ceres. So that's our next stop, Ceres. Uh, it's bigger than Vesta, nearly 1,000 kilometers in diameter, likely has uh, a lot of water or water ice, um, and, a, and a, as I said, a very large body. It is the largest body left in the solar system uh, out to Pluto that hasn't been visited um, by a spacecraft. So this is what the spacecraft looks like. It's 20 meters wingtip to wingtip. Uh, at the time it was launched, it was the biggest planetary spacecraft that NASA had launched. Um, and, but the core of the spacecraft is relatively small, only a couple of meters tall, has three ion engines, a one and a half meter high gain antenna, and 10 kilowatts of solar array power. Uh, it's not a real heavy spacecraft. Um, it's about, well, a little over 1,200 kilograms. About a third of that mass is the xenon propellant. It's the largest amount of xenon launched to date, uh, 425 kilograms. And uh, some numbers to keep in mind, a total of 2.5 kilowatts maximum into the propulsion system. Even though we have a 10 kilowatt array, we only have put 2.5 kilowatts into the propulsion system. That's because the array is sized for operations at 3 AU, not at 1 AU. And the specific mass of the propulsion system of the whole spacecraft is 280 kilograms per kilowatt. That'll become an important number uh, as we look, as we go on. Uh, okay, so 425, 425 kilograms of xenon. To get there, we only need 360 kilograms plus another 20 for the operations around the two bodies, and everything else is just the engineering details, uh, margins and residuals and, and that sort of stuff. Spacecraft's already used 300 kilograms of xenon. We've got another 121 uh, remaining. Looks like we'll have plenty of xenon to complete the mission, which is a good thing. Uh, so this is what the propulsion system looks like. As I said, three engines. Um, we only run one at a time. There's two of these PPUs, power processing units. This is the complicated box of electronics that converts the solar ray power into the currents and voltages that the engine needs. Um, we carry two, so we have one spare. We can do the whole mission on just two engines. We carry a spare engine. There are three engines because they wear out, and uh, otherwise we could have carried just two. Um, and each engine is mounted to its own uh, mechanical gimbal. And that's shown here. It's a hexapod design. It has two stepper motors, which basically change the length of the, the struts so you can point the engine. That allows us to do pitch and yaw control of the vehicle uh, whenever the ion propulsion system is on, which is most of the time. And, uh, and that minimizes the amount of uh, hydrazine propellant you need for uh, attitude control. And in fact, in order to minimize that further, they now let the spacecraft thrust for a month at a time before talking to it again. At the beginning of the mission, they did that. They thrusted a week at a time and then stopped, uh, turned the spacecraft to point the high gain antenna at Earth and uh, downlink the data, uplink new commands. Now they do that once a month they get, as they gain more experience with the spacecraft. And that allows them to save uh, uh, hydrazine propellant. And they have to do that because the 
crappy reaction wheels uh, on this vehicle are uh, failing. Uh, so they can still do the mission because we do attitude control mostly with the ion propulsion system, um, which is on, as I said, most of the time. All right, so uh, speaking of time, the initial checkout, we put a, almost 300 hours on the engines. Uh, one of them was a one week long test, that was this one. But now the propulsion system so far has run for almost 32,000 hours. You know, you're, most people are used to propulsion systems running for a few minutes, maybe an hour. This is 32,000 hours. The previous record was Deep Space One, where its ion propulsion system ran about half that, about 16,000 hours. We have another 15,000 hours to go to complete the mission, but um, these systems uh, can run uh, for a very long time, and in fact, need to run for a very long time. Uh, so we have now completed uh, successfully all of the mission phases up uh, to date so far. We are uh, cruising two series, and the propulsion system has provided a delta V of 8.3 kilometers per second. Uh, out of the 11 that we need to complete the mission. So we're, we're a long ways there. So the question is, how does that compare to other missions? So I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> here are 18 other deep space missions where what we've plotted is the kind of a weird parameter, but it's the delta V beyond Earth escape. So these are all beyond Earth escape. How much delta V? And we've divided into what's provided by the launch vehicle, which is in red, versus what's, what's provided with the on, by the onboard propulsion system. So you see Dawn way over here. The launch vehicle launched us to a positive C3, so to Earth escape. And then the large green bar is the nearly, is the 11 kilometers per second that the ion propulsion system will provide. The uh, other large green bar is Deep Space One, which provided about four and a half kilometers per second. You can see New Horizons here, their large post-launch delta V was all provided by the, or post-escape delta V is all provided by the launch vehicle. The largest onboard propulsion delta V was actually Magellan, which was, had a big solid rocket motor to break into to Venus orbit. So uh, a huge uh, sea change in delta V capability. All right, to run this, uh, we're going outbound. We have a 10 kilowatt array. Uh, for a long time, we could run the propulsion system at two and a half kilowatts because we had a lot more power than we needed. Until we got here, we were far enough from the sun that the available power couldn't run the propulsion system at full power. We had to start throttling the engines. Um, we got down to here, and now we're actually headed inbound, which we will through uh, October. That's the natural uh, orbit of the trajectory. The propulsion system can actually go down to 500 watts. And later on in the mission, this will turn back around and we'll get down close to 500 watts. So you have to be able to throttle this uh, for outbound uh, solar-powered missions. And then one uh, kind of fun thing, well, it's fun to me, may not be too fun to you. The way these propulsion, the way these engines work is the ions are accelerated through a set of closely spaced grids. They're about a half a millimeter apart and they stand off 1,400 volts during normal operations. So as you imagine, occasionally you can get an arc breakdown between those two closely spaced grids. And we call that a high voltage recycle. The power electronics senses that, turns off the high voltage, that clears the arc and it turns the voltage back on. That whole process takes about a second. It doesn't hurt anything. And in ground tests, we find that that happens about once an hour in tests. Well, space is a much better place to run these engines. and. Uh, I'll just give you an example here. 50 kilograms of throughput corresponds to about 5,000 hours of operation. So if we go up here, at this point, we should have had about 5,000 recycles we get once an hour, but we actually only got 50, so two orders of magnitude less. And that's because space is a much cleaner environment than the ground test facilities. And then on this particular engine, once we got out to here, the last 8,000 hours of operation, we've had no high voltage recycles at all. So the engine has cleaned itself up and just runs much better in space than on the ground. And uh, this, uh, so what you know, people really care about is, you know, we don't care about high voltage recycles, we care about thrust because that's what gets us places. So this is the thrust uh, in millinewtons as a function of on time for one of the thrusters. 
comparing what we calculate from the telemetry versus the navigation reconstruction of what the thrust had to be in order to get the spacecraft where it actually was observed. And what they find is that the thrust is, the telemetry that we calculate the thrust from, uh, the actual thrust is maybe about 1% lower than that. Uh, but the fact that it's within about 1% is the reason I still have a job. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, then they, to, to plan the mission f uh, in the future, they assume that the thrust is 3% low. That's just being conservative. OK, so Don's doing very well, knock on wood. Uh, propulsion systems operated for 32,000 hours, 8.3 kilometers per second. And uh, we're on course to get to series in the spring of, of 2015, assuming we can keep running for another 15,000 hours. OK, so based on that, let's scale the system up by a couple of orders of magnitude. <laughs> All right, so there have been lots and lots of studies on using electric propulsion to go to Mars. Um, and so rather than summarize all of those for you, um, I picked out one. And I picked it out for a very specific reason. But this is a study done a couple of years ago by people from JPL, Langley, and JSC. And I picked it out because of the specific mass that they used for the vehicles. In propulsion, there's really th only three things you've got to be concerned with. Power. Power is true in propulsion for anything, whether you're on the Earth, uh, on a cruise ship, you know, in a 747. Power is the key, but it has to be power with a specific mass. Uh, that's the second important parameter. And the third one is, of course, the specific impulse that everybody knows for, uh, from propulsion. So in this case, they looked at... Uh, missions to, not actually to Mars, but to Mars's moons. Um, and they looked at Mars uh, cargo vehicles with electric propulsion at 300 kilowatts, and um, uh, actually taking the crew there with the combination of hybrid SEP chem mission. These are the flight elements that they included, a crew module, deep space habitats, um, uh, space ex excursion vehicles, space storable chemical propulsion, zero boil off cryo propulsion, and the two SEP vehicles. And they looked at three scenarios, all chemical propulsion, uh, SEP cargo delivery with chemical propulsion for the crew, and then SEP cargo delivery with a SEP chem hybrid for the crew. And all three, significantly, all three scenarios assume, as James uh, in the previous talk or earlier talk said, all three assume the use of SEP cargo for pre-positioning equipment ahead of time uh, at the Martian moons. So uh, without going into a lot of detail, um, they, have a, they depart from uh, elliptical high Earth orbit uh, because that's energetically attractive. Uh, the SEP-CHEM hybrid uses the SEP system to help complete the transfers between Earth and Mars. And again, also, as uh, James said, so basically the bottom line is with the SEP cargo vehicle, it roughly cuts the mass, initial mass in low Earth orbit about in half. And if you throw in the crew and the hybrid SEP chem mission, um, it allows you to eliminate the zero boil off uh, cryo stage. And uh, so you don't have to develop that technology. With this, so you might say, well, geez, you put the crew on a SEP vehicle, it takes forever to get there. Uh, but this is a hybrid, and that hybrid um, allows you to do the mission, these are conjunction style missions, in just a couple of months longer than the, the all chem case. So what you need now is, in this scenario, 300 to 700 kilowatt uh, SEP vehicle. So we go from our two and a half kilowatt SEP vehicle for Dawn to 300 to 700 kilowatts. Um, okay, so how do we get there? First thing, uh, space solar power. Uh, it would, it was interest, we were interested in seeing what is the highest powered, solar powered spacecraft launched any year uh, over the space program. So we looked at that, so we plotted the highest power, these are not all the spacecraft that are flown, but just the highest power in any particular year. Uh, going back to 1959, Vanguard had one watt of solar power. <laughs> uh, ending with the, uh, the International Space Station, which beginning of life has about 260 kilowatts of solar power. So we see that we're roughly on a line where the amount of solar power in space is doubled every four years for 50 years. Um, 
but with some exceptions. Uh, so I've highlighted here CERT-2, it's a space electric rocket test number two. Um, it was, uh, had a one kilowatt of power launched in 1970, so it was well ahead of its time, well above the curve. A couple years later, Skylab was launched uh, with nearly almost 10 kilowatts of uh, solar array power once they fixed the arrays. Uh, if we fast forward to the, to the recent past, Deep Space One and Dawn are also highlighted here. Those are the two ion propulsion missions that NASA has flown. They're both well below the curve, indicating that the available power, solar power in space has caught up to uh, and surpassed the needs at least of robotic, uh, small robotic uh, solar electric propulsion spacecraft. Um, the other interesting thing is our little Dawn spacecraft, which is a discovery style, not very big, low, relatively low budget spacecraft, has more solar power than the human space station from 35 years earlier. So that's a significant difference in uh, technology. Now you might say, we were really on this curve, <laughs> right? But, you know, things change and we actually wound up historically uh, on that one. So now the question is, uh, you can see a kind of bifurcation and that occurred around the year 2000 or so where the power levels for this curve are really by, generated by the highest power levels by the ISS. So are we going to be on that trend, the green one, or on the red trend? The question is, which, which future do we want? So in part, uh, James Reuter had discuss technology developments. One of the keys, as far as I'm concerned, is the work that STMD is doing on uh, solar, solar array development. And so this is, they have two, uh, what they call SAS contracts, solar array system contracts, one to deployable space systems, the other to ATK, to develop solar arrays that are, comp have a compact storage, self-deploying, lightweight, um, in the 30 to 50 kilowatt range. So you see Dawn is about 10 kilowatts, Biggest geocomsats flying today are about 24 kilowatts beginning of life. They're trying to move the, the bar to higher power, lightweight, affordable solar arrays. So if we had that, then we can get carried away. And here's our 300 kilowatt vehicle. In this case, it's a design that makes use of the ROSA solar arrays from deployable space systems. 300 kilowatts into the propulsion system, about 360 kilowatt solar array. Includes eight 43 kilowatt hall thrusters, um, 2,000 second ISP, 18 millinewtons. That sounds, doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're electric propulsion, that's a lot. But the key thing is, with a fairly detailed mass, the estimate is a specific power of around 40 kilograms per kilowatt. So that's significant, because if you remember the study that uh, I showed you earlier, they were assuming worse specific masses, uh, at least for the cargo vehicle, more like 50 or so. So that suggests that um, their analysis is a reasonable extraction, extrapolation of the, the state of the art. But the question is, how do we get there? All right, here's what the vehicle looks like compared to Dawn. It's about 65 meters wingtip to wingtip. Dawn is about 20 meters wingtip to wingtip. So this is a really big vehicle. It can store maybe 30 metric tons of xenon compared to 0.4 metric tons of xenon. And uh, it's awesome. If you could build that, it's awesome. So let's compare it to the space shuttle main engines, which I know we're not flying anymore. But if you take three space shuttle main engines and you burn them for eight minutes, you have a total energy in the exhaust of about 1.9 million kilowatt hours. I'm sure you'll all remember that, right? 1.9 million kilowatt hours. And used up about 800 metric tons of propellant. Now, how does that compare to our 300 kilowatt vehicle? So we run seven engines at a time of these 43 kilowatt hull thrusters, 2,000 second ISP. And instead of eight minutes, we run them for 10,000 hours, it's a little bit over a year, but remember Dawn's already run for three times that, 30,000 hours. And in 10,000 hours, lo and behold, you have the same total energy in the exhaust, 1.9 million kilowatt hours. That's amazing. That suggests that high power SEP uh, 
is not unreasonable to think about moving uh, crew around the solar system, and you've only used 30 tons instead of 800 tons of propellant. But we still can't build a 300 kilowatt SEP vehicle. So now, uh, now that you all like electric propulsion, let's look at some of the recent technology advances made just in the last couple of years. And to do that, we have to understand a little bit about how these thrusters work, these hull thrusters. They're a little bit different than the ion engine on Dawn. No grids in this case. So here's a cutaway of a hull thruster. There's a cathode or electron emitter on the outside and an, an anode or an electron collector at the back end. And it's cylindrical, uh, it's an annular shape. We take a power supply and put 300 volts between the anode and the cathode. If you do that and you put in xenon gas, you'll break the gas down, you'll get a plasma, and plasmas are highly conductive. So very, very conductive. So if that's all you did, this 300 volts would show up either in a thin region at the cathode or a thin region at the anode, and all you would do is heat those electrodes and uh, you wouldn't get any thrust. So what they do is they take a magnetic field and put it radially across this device. The electrons have a hard time going across that magnetic field because this field is designed to be strong enough to magnetize them. And that forces this 300 volts to show up across that magnetic field. So now you have 300 volts across there. So you get an electric field pointing that way, magnetic field pointing that way. Those crossed fields give you an E cross B drift, which is this curly cued looking thing. That's analogous to the Hall current, which gives the thruster its name, the Hall thrusters. Now, if, you, if these electrons come this way, they pick up some energy, they run into a xenon atom, knock off a, an electron, you get a positive xenon ion. This electric field now zings those ions out uh, at about 30 uh, kilometers per second. And uh, the ions don't feel the magnetic field because they're much more massive, so they're not magnetized. And, uh, and then the ions going this way drag along electrons to uh, current neutralize the device. So there it is. Now you're all experts in Hall thrusters, and, uh, and that's, all it, that's all it took. Of course, it took a development in the Soviet Union uh, decades to work that out. All right, so I promised three recent technology advances which make it possible to build electric propulsion systems that are much, much better than uh, what's currently flying on Dawn. And these are the three advances, direct drive, magnetically shielded hull thrusters, and then metallic walled thrusters. So first, direct drive. This is the way all electric propulsion systems are flying today. There's a solar array, maybe 100 volts output, some kind of power uh, regulation unit, and then a power conversion unit that takes the solar array power and converts it to the currents and voltages that the thruster needs. These two boxes of electronics are hard to develop, and expensive, heavy, and inefficient. That ought to be enough. So, but if you have a Hall thruster that requires a 300 volt DC input and you had a solar array that, put a, that output 300 volts DC, it begs the question, why can't you just couple them together and directly drive the thruster off the, the solar array? So that had occurred to people. In fact, it occurred to people back in the 1970s. Uh, so this is not a new idea. But the, but the idea is directly drive the thruster off the solar array with nothing more than a capacitor in between to do the impedance matching and get rid of all this complicated, heavy, inefficient power processing. Good idea. Question is, will it work? So we put in uh, 10 kilowatts, actually 12 kilowatts of solar array power on the roof of the lab at JPL and ran, tried to run a Hall thruster directly off of the solar array with just a capacitor in between. If you could do that, you improve the efficiency of the PPU to 99%, reduce its mass by 80%, the radiator mass by 80%, and it ripples through the rest of the system. Allows you to build really high power systems because all you have is a solar array and a thruster. Okay, so to make a long story short, it works great. <laughs> the, the literature is chock full of reasons that it wouldn't work or concerns. Turns out none of them were true. Um, we could run, and this data shows, that you could run up to and right at the peak power point. You could actually run to the left of the peak power point, which is normally unstable. Um, you could recover from faults uh, that if you collapse the array. 
We showed how you could run multiple thrusters direct drive, how you could start and stop them without needing high current switches. Uh, and the system turns out to be uh, very uh, stable and very easy to control. So direct drive is one. The next one, now here we've got to use your knowledge of how hall thrusters work. Here's a conventional hall thruster, radial mag magnetic field, electric field going this way. If you plot the voltage along this wall, you get this curve. You see a big change in voltage as you go from 300 volts in the plasma here to zero out here. You have a big change in voltage right along the wall. That means to keep from shorting this out, these walls have to be made of an insulator. And typically boron nitride or some form of that is used in these thrusters. Magnetic shielding changes the magnetic field near the wall to this grazing field shape, where now if you plot the voltage along the wall, you see that it's constant. This does a lot of really good things for you. One is you don't get energetic ions hitting the wall, and so wearing out of these walls is the principal failure mode for the thrusters. If you don't get energetic ions hitting the walls, it turns out you can slow that wear out failure mode down by at least two orders of magnitude, effectively making the thrusters immortal. immortal. Um, the other thing is, if you don't have uh, a voltage gradient along the wall, that says, well, why do you need insulating walls anymore? Why can't you just use it to uh, build a metallic wall? So magnetic shielding allows you to build thrusters that don't wear out. And it also allows you to replace the boron nitride, which is kind of mechanically like soap, a little bit stronger, but uh, with something more easy to work with, like graphite, you could make it out of any conducting material. And if magnetic shielding is really true, you'd expect no change in the performance. And that is indeed what they found when they compared these two thrusters. So that means you can make thrusters that are easier to make, lower cost. Uh, it's easier to scale them to bigger sizes because you don't have to have big insulating pieces. Um, you get a better thermal design, you can run them at higher power densities. So now we have thrusters that don't wear out. You can make big ones uh, that are easier to, more cost effective to build and direct drive uh, to make better systems. The last piece is the cathodes. You need lots of current and uh, we borrow this technology again from the Russians, la uh, lanthanum hexaboride cathodes much easier from the propellant handling standpoint because they don't care about contamination. All right, and so earlier I said 43 kilowatt thrusters. Here is a 50 kilowatt thruster that was run at NASA Glenn, actually up to 70 kilowatts, and they ran it on both xenon and then krypton because if you're worried about xenon, running out of xenon, you can run krypton. People have looked at uh, new advances of nesting the hall thrusters, so you get to higher power levels in a compact device. And also alternate propellants, if you're looking at uh, in situ resource utilization, you run hall thrusters on magnesium and even iodine. Uh, so, and the technology that's currently under development, uh, as James said, from STMD, is to use the magnetic shielding technology to boost the ISP. Uh, typical hall thrusters run at 2,000 seconds. With a magnetic shielding, you can run them at 3,000 seconds. And that technology has now been transferred to two different thrusters at 10 and 20 kilowatts. And, uh, uh, and you can get that high ISP, again, with a thruster that doesn't wear out. And for the asteroid redirect mission, they're looking at something that's in between those two thrusters, about 12 and a half kilowatts. So, which brings me to the next topic. Here is our solar array powers. Deep Space One at two kilowatts, Dawn at 10. The mission scenario that I showed were three to 700 kilowatts. That's a really big gap to jump. You could, you know, if someone gave you enough money, you could probably do that, but it would be very, very risky. So what you really need is something in between. And a good candidate for that is this asteroid redirect mission, which uh, is currently looking at a 50 kilowatt beginning of life solar array. So which makes a nice stepping stone to uh, the higher power systems that you will almost certainly need for delivering lots of cargo uh, to Mars. So I'll, I'll close by saying a few words about this uh, redirect mission. 
uh, why, why do this? I know this is a subject of, uh, a, uh, pl of uh, um, what do you call that? Well, <laughs> this evening, there's a panel session this evening. So uh, anyway, so one, there's really a couple of basic reasons. One is it's an excellent stepping stone to the higher power systems uh, that are almost certainly needed for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. It is a, an affordable approach that gives you the ability to um, extend human exploration beyond low Earth orbit, because I'm sure nobody in this room wants to spend another decade or two of astronauts going around the Earth in low Earth orbit. It makes use of SLS and Orion that are already under development. It forces solutions to uh, keep the crew safe on missions that could be up to 20 or 30 days a long way from home. Uh, not as far as a near-Earth asteroid, and certainly not as far as Mars, but again, affordability is uh, one of the keys here. And ultimately, it could help uh, move along the process of uh, utilizing in-space uh, material resources. So as uh, James Reuter said, this, this mission concept is enabled by high-power solar electric propulsion. If you tried to do it, and here's an example uh, for the asteroid 2008 HU4, Assuming it's 1,000 metric tons, if you tried to do that with a space storable biprop system, you'd need to launch about 360 tons of stuff into low Earth orbit. So you're talking about whatever flavor of heavy lift launch vehicle you, you have, you have multiple heavy lift launch vehicles on orbit assembly, uh, very unaffordable. Even if you had a zero boil off LOX hydrogen uh, technology, you'd still have multiple heavy lift launches. Or you could boil it all down to a single. EELV launch, a single Atlas V launch with a 40 kilowatt SEP system. That's pretty remarkable. And this is what the system would look like. Uh, it's compatible with either of the solar array technologies currently under development, either the ROSA array or the Megaflex design from ATK. These vehicles can hold 10 metric tons of xenon, process 40 kilowatts from the 50 kilowatt arrays and they have a specific mass of 100 kilograms per kilowatt. That's the entire vehicle. So 100 kilograms per kilowatt, if you remember, Dawn was 280 kilograms per kilowatt. The Mars cargo vehicle, we wanted around 50. So again, not only in power, but also in specific mass and in specific impulse, this is a good stepping stone to get there. So people always ask, yeah, okay, but are there any targets? Uh, this is to capture an entire near-Earth asteroid so the estimated uh, population of 10-meter class asteroids is, suggests there's something like 100 million of them. Of that population, we know about 380 have been discovered. Uh, of the 100 million, it's estimated with the current population models that maybe 15,000 have uh, the right kind of orbit characteristics that would make them uh, retrievable. And of those 15,000, we know 14. So here they are. These are the 14 that we know. We've done detailed mission design on seven of them to know that, uh, that we could, if we knew what their masses were, that they would be retrievable. It's likely that these would work out as well. But very few of these have been characterized to the point where we know that they're good targets. Um, we're currently discovering them at a rate of two or three per year. There's a way of increasing that. Uh, relatively affordably to maybe double that, maybe increase it by an order of magnitude. So I thought it might, you might want to see what a, a six and a half uh, meter boulder looks like. So the LA County Museum of Art <coughs> put one on display. So if you ever go to LA, go down to LACMA and you can see what, a, uh, what the size of the rock would look like. Okay, here's what the mission looks like. Um, we launch either on an EELV or a Falcon Heavy, or an SLS. If you launch on an EELV, you launch to an Earth orbit, and spiral out to a lunar gravity assist. If you launch on a heavy lift launch vehicle, you can bypass the spiral out, go directly to the lunar gravity assist. SEP system takes you to the asteroid, spend 60 days studying it, and capturing it, detumbling it, and then the SEP system redirects it back to another lunar gravity assist, uh, we do that, that gets us into the Earth-Moon system, and then we thrust a little bit more to get it into a, an orbit that's stable for on the order of more than 100 years. And once it's there, then the, the uh, crew from SLS and Orion can get there. 
So one of the key features of this mission was the identification of this distant retrograde orbit around the moon. Uh, the, the neat thing is, so this is an orbit altitude of about 70,000 kilometers above the lunar surface. They're retrograde, um, and it's, uh, they've explored the stability out to 250 years. And the neat thing is you can get there both with a 1,000 metric ton asteroid in tow, and SLS and Orion can also get there uh, with their current uh, systems. So it's a, actually a really excellent uh, place to deliver it. So the final question is then, how do we inspire the next generation of people? How do we inspire, inspire people to do something significant in space, given the budget constraints that we're currently working under? So thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm not sure what baby talk is, but I'll try. So the dawn thrust is 91 millinewtons at full power, and so that is the equivalent. Well, actually, if you had uh, nine one dollar, if you gave me nine one dollar bills, I could show you. No. <laughs> It's actually the weight of, of nine one dollar bills, or a single sheet of eight and a half by eleven paper. Is, uh, are all those solar arrays for the larger proposed units uh, really uh, easier or lighter weight than a small nuclear source of electricity? Yeah. Yeah. So the question, question is, are, is solar are solar arrays better than a nuclear reactor? Basically, is the power level, and. Uh, and if you're, if, it depends on where you're going. But out to Jupiter, well, let's see, certainly to Mars, and it depends on also on the power level. So it depends on a lot of things. But basically the answer is hell yes. <laughs> it's much better because, you know, NASA kind of bent their pick on, uh, on space nuclear reactors for the JIMO, the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter uh, program. And what you find is that when you build a reactor, the reactor is small, right? But, but what you wind up is a big vehicle anyway, because you have all these radiators. That you have to radiate a lot of power because the power conversion is so bad. The nice thing about solar rays is they just take care of themselves. When you don't use the power, they're self-radiating. And when you use it, especially in a direct drive mode, there's nothing else to radiate because almost all the power goes directly to the thruster. It's a very nice system. Who has been given the credit for the, uh, for the original Paul thruster? Oh, so the question is, who's been given credit for it? So that technology was, well, so there's a little bit debate over, uh, you know, where it was originated, but it was really made into a successful uh, device in the Soviet Union. And so that would be Zharinov and Morozov. Yes. So the question was, will we, in the asteroid redirect mission, will we be working with commercial, the commercial sector like planetary resources or deep space industries? And absolutely, that we would love to have their, their involvement um, in, uh, in it's possible in a variety of uh, phases of that mission. But that hasn't, you know, certainly not been worked out by any means. But uh, providing a resource for them to practice on would certainly, we think, would be very attractive to them. And, and we... We're, we've had discussions with, with both those companies. But, yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how far can you use solar electric propulsion? Uh, how far from the sun can you get? Um, so right now, with with the solar ray technologies that. STMD is developing, with, if they're successful in the specific powers for that, that out to Jupiter, the solar rays will actually be lighter than the ASRGs uh, out to Jupiter. Um, there are, but there's lots of ways to use electric propulsion to do Saturn missions, for example, and even farther out. Because what you do is you wind up in the solar system, building up energy, and then you go screaming out. In fact, we can get to Saturn faster than you could build a chemical stage to break you into orbit at Saturn. So, so it, you don't have to, you usually probably don't thrust beyond about three AU, 
but you can build up energy in the inner solar system and still go to do outer planet missions with solar electric propulsion. Yeah. Uh, have, you, have you done it? Oh, it's here. Uh, have you? No. Two questions also. Why is it that the Okay, okay, so the first question is, why is the thrust decreasing on dawn? Um, it's decreasing because the amount of solar power is decreasing. So the thrusters aren't wearing out, at least I hope not. Um, it's just following the available power. The second question is, does the asteroid redirect use a gravity tractor approach? And uh, the answer to that is no. We basically bag the entire object and then uh, hug it uh, next to the spacecraft and then uh, detumble it and push it back. Let me. Yeah. Uh, and you've done studies on uh, using the, the, the wind up and the wind up to uh, to push the hab, uh, the human hab and stuff up to to a near Earth uh, uh, escape and then. Uh, as, as one of the last times it comes by, send up the crew. Right. Yeah. And, that, and this small capsule. Oh. So, 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 so that's, that's exactly, exactly the, the, the scenario. So the question was, can you use the SCP to put the uh, deep space hab into an energetically favorable high Earth orbit uh, and then rendezvous with the crew there and then blast off from there? And that's exactly what that study that I showed did. So that, that's a good way to get to, to Mars. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, let me go to the... So it's a... We're going to deliver it to a distant retrograde orbit. So it's a... Around the moon. Yeah, it's a lunar distant retrograde orbit. Um, again, that's a more complicated question because one of the part of the attractiveness for xenon is not only how well it works in the engine, but how it works in the overall system, how you store it, and how you control the flow rates and all that stuff. But basically, for electric propulsion, you typically want a heavy particle because you have to ionize it. You have to ionize all the propellant that you accelerate, and so if you, it's almost as hard to ionize a light particle as a heavy atom. So you might as well ionize heavy atoms, and uh, so xenon is attractive for that. But pretty much anything you can turn into a gas you can use. It turns out magnesium runs very well in these thrusters. Iodine runs well. Krypton, not quite as well as xenon because it's lighter. Um, and, uh, but it, you have to look at the whole system. Uh, you could run mercury like they used to. Yes? Oh. Um, you mentioned a hybrid system. Chem hybrid going to the Martian moons, uh, is there a breakdown in the time? And that, that paper that has all that information. And there's, it's also more complicated because once you get to Mars, you use the SEP system to spiral you down to uh, Phobos or Deimos. That takes time as well. So, and that's, that details in the paper. Thank you. All right, thank you.